What's up guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and my guest today is Amy Wilkinson, the CEO of Ingenuity, a lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Business, and the author of The Creator's Code, which ended up being most of our conversation today. The Creator's Code was a book that Amy published in 2016 after interviewing over 200, but publishing on 200 founders across the United States, founders that had grown businesses past $100 million in sales. And this was an absolutely fascinating discussion on what it takes to make it as an entrepreneur. Now, why is this relevant to me? Well, if you're a subscriber, you know that I'm an investor in early stage companies and I focus on people over everything else every single time. I think it is without question the single most important factor in the high risk speculative investment space. So. I don't know anybody who's invested as much time in studying entrepreneurs as Amy, and we dug into that very deep today, and big names like Elon Musk, one of her core subjects. And so tons of takeaways today, and I really, really enjoyed this conversation. One of those conversations where I wrap it up and I'm just like, I don't know how I got so lucky that I get to do this for a living, but I'm glad that I do, and I'm glad that I get to share it with you. So if you enjoy this conversation, uh, please like the video, subscribe, turn on notifications, all that stuff. And I publish a weekly newsletter every Friday morning where I share my biggest takeaways, my biggest lessons learned, and any actions I'm taking in the market with my cash. And I publish every Friday morning and it's free. And right beneath this video, there is a pinned comment with the link where you can subscribe to that newsletter. Amy Wilkinson, enjoy. What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation. And that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Hey guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House. And my next guest is Amy Wilkinson, the CEO of Ingenuity, a lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Business, author of The Creator's Code, which I'm excited to talk about and many, many other things. But Amy, thanks so much for making time and coming on the program. Yeah, delighted. Good to meet you. So, well, well, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to diving into a handful of, of topics with you. And what initially uh, caught my attention was The Creator's Code, a book that you authored, and I believe in 2016, where you interviewed 200 Silicon Valley based entrepreneurs that have grown businesses, correct me if I've got some of these data points wrong, to past uh, $100 million valuations and essentially dissected the similarities, right? What are the, the common denominators among these individuals? So that's correct. I did 200 interviews, but they're not all Silicon Valley and they're not all tech. So I had been in the White House economics team ahead of that and rolled out and I spent five years at Harvard. So I was in the East when I was doing that work. Uh, and so it's entrepreneurs that have started and scaled businesses to 100 million in revenue, but they're across the United States. It's US based data. So, uh, for example, the Giovanni founders in upstate New York, that's a zero to billion dollar story in revenue in five years, like faster than a lot of tech businesses. Uh, Under Armour, Kevin Plank opens the book. He's in Baltimore. Um, the Spanx founder, Sarah Blakely, is in Atlanta. Etc. So uh, I've certainly interviewed many of the tech founders up and down Silicon Valley, but it's a more broad data set than that. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And Kevin Plank's a really interesting entrepreneur. I think I saw he him. Is. He might have keynoted at CES when I was there and he was, yeah, communicating how people shouldn't look at Under Armour as an entire company, but they should look at Under Armour as a technology company because everything they make has some sort of ancillary utility. Uh, and so, so what inspired you to, uh, let's start, let's start with the creator's code. What, what inspired you to take this on? Uh, so I am a sociologist by training. I'm interested in people. Uh, I'm also, I have an MBA, so I'm interested in the high growth people behind high growth business. And, uh, I was an English major, so I like writing. I just decided that I would carve out a sabbatical. I was transitioning out of the white house and coming back towards Silicon Valley I thought it'd be easy to write a book. It, the truth is, it's the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. Hmm. Uh, I have the biggest data set in the US on high scale founders. And it turned into a five year project from start to finish before uh, the book was out with Simon & Schuster. So it's, uh, if for anyone who wants to write a book, it's an entrepreneurial endeavor all by itself. 
to try to get out as a first time writer for sure. Yeah. You know what I hear frequently and I've, I haven't published a book yet. It's absolutely uh, in the three year plan, which, you know, based on what you just shared, the clock is ticking on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I thought that was an 18 months plan. I mean, I thought it was a 12 to 18 months sabbatical. Right. So it's the you know, right. books take on a life of their own, but I'm sure you'll do a great job. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I mean, the, the most common mistake I hear, I guess, authors share with me is that they thought they could do it part time. You know, they thought right. they could maybe carve out two, three hours a day or one, two days a week and author a book. And, um, you know, they advised a hard no on that game plan. Take the dedicated sabbatical that is whatever that is, six months, three years, whatever it needs to be, and dedicate all of your energy toward that or you're just going to hate life trying to piece it. Yeah, out. it's a, a full-time job. The the thing too about books is that uh, there are different kinds of books. Most of the entrepreneurship world or the business world is like one man's story. Uh, the difference with writing a big ideas book and the creator's code is based on 200 interviews. So if you write a research-based book or a big ideas book, that's a much bigger endeavor than most people who write a book saying, here's how I ran my company, right? Yeah. Um, because that's, that's not a research-based book. That's, you know, how you ran your company. So there are different kinds of books. And for readers out there, people learning about investing, certainly, or business or entrepreneurship, you do want to have a lens. I have a totally different lens now on what I read based mm. on, you know, how much research went behind that. So there's, there's books and then there's other books. There's big idea books. Yeah. Yeah. How could you not after having gone through it yourself? Right. With what was, yeah, you learn, you learn. Yeah. And so your guest list was really, you know, the, the top tier, right? You, you mentioned a few, uh, in addition to some major headline makers, some for good, some for not. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes, you know, Theranos, one that I'd love to sort of dive into that because I believe, well, yeah, you covered her story she prior to book. the, That's correct. prior to the Theranos scandal. Um, you know, what always struck me about that, because I was at the, I think it was like the Tech Crunch Crunchy Awards in mm -hmm. San Francisco prior to the Theranos scandal being publicized. And she received an award at that show, you know, to a standing ovation and, and all this. And then when, you know, the truth came out that they weren't really doing what they said they were doing, I couldn't help but think, yeah, but had she found a way, we would have celebrated that story. You have an entrepreneur who's essentially faking it till she hopes to make it, right? And unfortunately, she didn't make it, so she's a criminal. But had she made it, we would have celebrated her risk tolerance, her audacity to come out and say, I don't know how yet, but I'm going to find a way. Had she put the puck in the net, it would have been a completely different perspective. What do you think about that? I agree with that. Um, you know, the mantra that you hear a lot, which you mentioned is fake it till you make it. Entrepreneurs are doing that up and down Silicon Valley. Uh, the venture industry thrives on it because in order to pitch some of the greatest investors, you have to show a hockey stick of growth. Right. So people want to hear these stories that there's, you know, a brand new innovation and it's <clears throat> going to change the way we live, I mean, quote, change the world. Right. That's talked about all up and down Silicon Valley all the time. Uh, I, I do think the difference here is a fraud. I mean, and so at some point, you know, are you exaggerating what you think the business can do or are you lying about what the business is doing? And so there is a fine line that's different. I, I agree with you that if she had been able to pull it out and if Theranos had been the pin prick blood test that was promised and was certainly talked about, uh, that we would be recording you know, this story in a very different way. So I have some empathy with her. I mean, especially as a dropout from Stanford, she was very young. I think that people can uh, start believing their own story, right? A little and, and lose a little bit of a reality check on the narrative that they're trying to create, especially young entrepreneurs. That's where you need a strong board. That's where you need a strong management team to come in. If you look at, uh, here's a difference. Mark Zuckerberg brings in Sheryl Sandberg early, right? There's a very experienced executive alongside an inexperienced mm -hmm. founder. Um, the Google guys do this, Larry and Sergey. They were at Stanford when I was at Stanford as an undergrad. Um, they bring in Eric Schmidt, and that's the quote, adult supervision, 
right? Yeah. That's supposed to be helping, right? And then Eric Schmidt steps out when Larry Page is ready and feels like he can step in. So, you know, there, there would be ways to safeguard this from happening and Saranos didn't have them. So I think that that's, that's a definite mistake. Could you, just for the benefit of anyone not familiar with Theranos' story, just, just give us the 30-second what happened there for context? Sure. So Theranos, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, is a dropout of Stanford, and she's 18 years old. She starts a blood diagnostics business, and it's a pinprick of blood in your finger. The idea is that a nanotainer, this little tiny um, container of one drop of blood could diagnose, you know, multiple things instead of vials of blood. The idea behind Theranos is that it would be easy and it would be available. It would be painless and you would get your blood drawn all the time then. And so instead of seeing one sample, like you do now, as you go to an annual physical, for example, maybe get your blood drawn once a year, you would have multiple little pinpricks and like a story would develop in a movie, you would start seeing multiple things and you would see the progression of disease so you could prevent it, right? And so this was the idea. It's a revolutionary idea behind the company. Um, it, it was stood up. Hundreds of millions of dollars were invested by top uh, venture investors. It had a $9 billion valuation at the peak and it had a board of trustees that had all the biggest names in the U.S. So Henry Kissinger, was um, on this, George Schultz, you know, former secretaries of state and defense. Elizabeth had come out of Washington, D.C. Her, her uh, parents have worked at USAID. So there was a big uh, idea that this company would be applied even to military. So if you want a diagnosis on a battlefield, you could take one, you know, quick turnaround of a drop of blood and in a couple hours, you could diagnose what the problems were. So it had a very big vision. Uh, yeah. And a very big board and a huge amount of investment. And they had taken over Facebook's uh, working space, former office space, right on the side of Stanford's campus. Okay, so then the big fall of this is a Wall Street Journal journalist comes in and does investigative uh, journalism and starts figuring out that the nanotainer is not working, that it's not a couple drops of blood, that they're actually fraudulently coming back and uh, titrating the blood with water. They're making a lot bigger samples. There's accuracy problems and they are delivering back false information. So they are, you know, uh, committing fraud with their investors. They're giving customers back uh, fraudulent reports, et cetera. And so the business comes crashing down in 2016. In 2016. Now, having interviewed her, the CEO, Elizabeth Holmes, do you think that things moved too fast and what became, you know, here's one way to, to, to speculate what might have occurred and you would know far better than I, but, you know, sometimes things don't go our way a little bit at the beginning of a scenario and we think, well, we're going to course correct. It's just a little error and I'll gloss over it with some, look, everything's going to be all right. Things are working and just got to hide the small error or small, uh, I don't know, um, uh, whatever, whatever is we need to correct. Okay. I'm not communicating this super effectively, but I hope you get my point. Yeah. I you know, but anyways, w without correction, this, this blossoms into a bigger and bigger lie to a point where it becomes so daunting to acknowledge the truth that I, you know, this has been a mistake that I've known about for a long time. So do you think it started as a small thing or do you think it's in her, was in her character to control the narrative, even if it meant being deceitful? Uh, I think all businesses have these accelerated narratives, right? And so I don't believe that her intent was to, to commit fraud. I really don't. And I, I think all the way through, and if you've read Bad Blood, the book um, written by this Wall Street Journal journalist, you know, I, I don't think he believes that she was intentionally trying to be deceptive. I think that um, she was really, truly trying to build a world-class um, revolutionary business. I, I do think to the point I made before, she didn't have real experienced people around her mm. and you start, it's an echo chamber. You start, you know, like probably losing your perspective as a very young and experienced founder. The yeah. other point, and I teach this at Stanford business school as a case study to watch out for now, but her board, none of them had diagnostic blood test experience. So she had a heavy stacked, famous um, board and none of her investors had invested in this space before. So to your audience of investors, 
right? The after after the fact, I started asking my Silicon Valley friends at some of the top VC funds, and they started saying we knew that was a problem because no one had experience that was on the oversight. Not a single person knew how to to uh, probe the, the right questions on a blood diagnostics business. Yeah, and so she, you know, didn't have safeguards even around herself there, which is an important thing for a founder to think to think through. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it, it's so interesting to me because, you know, anybody who watches my channel, you know, when I'm vetting entrepreneurs and all this, looking for the next home for my cash, I'm all about the people. But, you know, what that really means is, yes, you're betting on somebody's uh, integrity, their, their judgment, their decision making competency, also their ability to surround themselves with other great thinkers, people that fill in their blind spots provide strengths to their weaknesses, all this stuff, in addition to, you know, the resilience and having a plan C when plan A and B fail and all of this stuff. Interesting point, though, because, you know, at, at the surface, you could look at that board and said, amazing credibility. And then you right. dive a little bit deeper and you're like, well, they're famous names, but they actually don't know a thing about the industry. So strategic maybe, but, but uh, okay, now I don't want to draw direct parallels to uh, another one of the entrepreneurs that you interviewed. Uh, for obvious reasons, but you know, another uh, very, very audacious, probably the most audacious entrepreneur in the world right now is Elon Musk, and mm -hmm. you know he was one of your your guests on Creators Code. So, talk to me about what, what struck me about Elon is that we look at him today as the boldest entrepreneur on the planet, right? The, the most insane risk tolerance, right? And I've heard you say, or at least describe him as not starting that way. You describe him as, I think, being in the foyer, uh, trying to land a job. Oh, what was the company? Remind me. AOL. AOL. In That's AOL. right. And right. The sheepish candidate trying to have a conversation and being being too shy or just not being able to get through. Um, you know, to, towards what he is today and, and some of his earliest business ventures being, you know, digitizing the yellow pages as an idea, which is completely yeah. unexciting and just sort of a boring evolution of a product we already consume just in a new way through to SpaceX. And so what, what did you learn? I guess what I'm asking is, you know, people often think you're either born that way or you're not. You're a leader or you aren't. And I completely disagree with that. And so what did you learn with people like Elon about that process of growing into, into boldness and growing into leadership? So I, I get asked this, you know, are you born an entrepreneur or do you become an entrepreneur? It's the nature nurture question all the time. Right. And I think um, for people like Elon, he he's out there as a different uh, breed, I think, than most entrepreneurs. But even in his story, he does grow and develop, right? So he is originally uh, in South Africa. He starts a couple of video gaming businesses with his brother, Kimball, who's on the board of Tesla. I mean, Kimball has been a part of this thing all the way through. But when they're teenagers, they're starting video gaming businesses. Elon is very socially awkward. I mean, you can see it now, even though he's famous and, you know, very successful. He's um, got some blind spots. All of us do. Right. And so as he progresses as an entrepreneur, I think he has always had the vision for sustainable transport. That's what he's trying to build with Tesla. Making life multi-planetary is what he's trying to do with SpaceX. And when I interviewed him, I have him on a video clip saying that, you know, he wrote papers about this in college. Mm. That, so it's not like he's making it up right now. I mean, it's not it's something he's been after for 35 years or more. Right, this vision of can you make life multiplanetary? To to the point here too, uh, I know him socially through friends, through the interview process. I asked him about SpaceX, and he literally stepped back, and we had a forty minute conversation about evolution, which is life starts as single celled organisms, then multi celled organisms. You know, then life goes from oceans to land, and now. Life needs to go from one planet to multiple planets. And that is the level in which he thinks, you know, uh, and I said to him, well, great, you know, but that's quite expensive. That's why he's making a reusable rocket. Uh, yeah. But he also said, well, it's not. We could have just a couple points of GDP. It's small potatoes. I mean, that's literally a quote. He's like, it's small potatoes. You know, I'd like a couple points of GDP. Most people are not thinking 
in those terms, right? Mm -hmm. But he is, and he's reasoning by first principles, mm -hmm. breaking problems down, building them back up with original thinking. You know, so I think he is different in that way from, from a lot of us, but every single person can be more entrepreneurial. And this is why I teach in the business school at Stanford. And this is uh, why I coach a number of entrepreneurs and and make investments as well, because you can see people grow and develop. And you certainly can see businesses grow and develop. Yeah. Now you touched on something really important there being first principles thinking, which mm -hmm. obviously is a catalyst, has to be a catalyst for something like SpaceX. And I think initially uh, Elon Musk intended on purchasing rockets, saw the price points right. completely unrealistic, determined he could build one for a tenth of the cost and began to do that by applying first principles, thinking I don't need a rocket, I need aluminum, I need copper, I need fuel, I need the That's ingredient it. to build a rocket. And I can purchase those at a tenth of the cost. Uh, you know, it, it's a balance as an investor, I find sometimes to treat first principles thinking and to wipe away assumptions that may misguide us, right? Right. Versus studying the past and learning from it, right? And which are both equally important. And I don't think it's, it's not one or the other. You need both, right? And have you seen in the, the 200 entrepreneurs that you interviewed, could you comment on how they juggle that balance of, you know, weighing the importance of past experience, past lessons and all of this, but being able to wipe away assumptions when they need to? Yeah, so th there's a juxtaposition there for sure. Um, I would say people like Elon, they read history all the time, right? So it's not that they're just out in the world creating new things without a context. Uh, they they are learning from other people. This is why Tesla is got the name it does. The boring company has the name it does. I mean, like he's he's studied inventors that have come before, right? And so there's a real importance in understanding history in order to inform your decisions to be a future maker. I would say. Um, but the other thing that's important is to come with a fresh point of view, a fresh perspective. So I'll give you a, an example of Airbnb. So those founders, um, as they come into the world, certainly they know about hotels. They know how the industry works. Uh, two of them are designers from the Rhode Island School of Design, Brian and Joe, right? And they have a note under their door in San Francisco that says your rent is up 25% and it's simply too expensive for them. So they bring in yeah, well, they, they have air mattresses and they have other designers coming to this conference. It happens the same time as their rent note, right? And they say, if anyone would like to sleep on our air mattresses and pay us a little bit, you can help us make our rent. We'll put a mint on the pillow. We'll pick you up at the airport. We'll show you around our city of San Francisco. We'll make it really nice for you. And they saw that that worked. Three people stayed with them. Now, it, Airbnb is known as, they laughingly say, the seven-year overnight success story, because it took seven years before anybody really knew about it. It was on the grid. They were passed on by every investor, right? And this is the repeated story. Because they were doing something fresh and new, something totally different from a hotel industry, it's weird and creepy when you have, you say, here's my house keys to a total stranger, or someone sleeping in your living room that you don't know, right? When they start this, it's super strange, um, now there are more people staying in Airbnb housing than any other major hotel chain in any given night around the world. So they create something new. It's not that they don't know the history. They know the history, but they're coming with this fresh point of view. And so, you know, it's both. I think many people read too much history and get stuck. And they say, because it didn't work in the past, it won't work a different way in the future. So you have to be able to look, there's a skill in, in the book called Drive for Daylight. Yes. You have to be able to look at the light on the horizon, right? So what's coming in front of you? Not competitors left to right, that's traditional benchmarking business. Not rear view mirror, that's history. Like what happened behind you? If you're moving really fast in an entrepreneurial marketplace, you're always looking forward. I love that. So it's a little bit of both, um, but the fresh perspective really matters. Uniqueness matters. Okay. Now, now, again, after having sat down with so many founders, would you, could you comment on this? You know, I, I wonder sometimes 
how much of success is generated by luck versus skill, intelligence, and foresight, and strategy, and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. we want to believe it's all skill, foresight, strategy, and all this because we want to feel proud of our successes and that I accomplished this because of the hard work I put in, the sacrifices I made, and all of this. But there's a large amount of chance in anything we endeavor, right? And, you know, I feel very like I'm born in Canada, right? Uh, predictable, stable country uh, in a supportive environment. The odds are stacked in my favor. And so I mm -hmm. feel like the more hands I play, the higher probability that I'll win. That's just kind of how I feel about life. And so it's my job to get out there as much as possible. And so it's not so much that I need to be the smartest or the most strategic, but if I'm really active, I win more frequently. And I've proven that to be true. Mm -hmm. You know where I'm going? Do you, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I agree. So Jeff Bezos would say it's more hits at bat, right? So Amazon, as he you know, grows a very large business, a very successful business, he just wants more hits at bat, more times up, and you will fail some of the time. Right. right. But you continue to experiment, you continue to try things, you continue to obviously surround yourself with good people, you create your own serendipity to some degree, you create your own luck. Um, I'm not going to take luck out of the equation entirely, however, because in building a business, it is who did you meet? Who did you hire? You know, who potentially made an introduction and how you capitalized on it? I mean, there's lots of things um, that are, ch are chance, but the more active that you are, the more hits at bat that you get, the more likely you are to create a high growth business. I think no doubt. So you can influence your luck, but there's some still luck involved. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and exactly to your point, like that person you met, that connection, maybe that meeting you missed. I That's mean, right. Google almost took an offer for sub $1 million right, right. to be bought right. in had that occurred right but in, we don't talk about that we talk about all the right decisions they made because of the foresight the intelligence and the strategy but there that's were right. just as many circumstances that could have diverted that path and we never would have heard about them yeah that's right i mean i think that there's a lot of hero worship with entrepreneurs and we read a lot of articles that are you know again this story of greatness and then everyone can rewrite history to some degree to make it look easier if you talk to entrepreneurs and you partner with them, you invest in them, you know how difficult it is. And this is one of the things when I went out to write a book, you know, people will give their time. Elon will say, hey, you know, one of the things that he said, and I have this in the book, is that starting a company is like chewing glass and staring into an abyss, yeah. right? I mean, it is really painful and really hard. And so when I ask him, well, you know, why do you do that then? He comes back with, well, it's only like that for three to five years. It's the first three to five years that are really hard. Then it gets easier. And then you say, well, gosh, it's still it's pretty rough, right? And then he says, well, because things matter. And so I, one of the bottom lines, I think, about being an entrepreneur or as an investor looking at really um, the characteristics of what will be successful entrepreneurs and successful businesses is that people are willing to take the setbacks when there's failures they believe so much in what they're doing. I mean, Elon, with SpaceX, there were three rocket explosions before the fourth one finally worked. He was broke. I mean, the New York Times wrote a story in 2008 that said uh, the PayPal founder uh, was broke and borrowing money from a friend. And I know that's true because I know who he borrowed money from. And so, you know, like, these are not easy stories. You have to have the stomach for... Uh, committing to a long-term goal and taking the setbacks. And then now he's obviously on top and everyone thinks that maybe that was an easy ride. He'd be the first person to say it was painful, really difficult at very various moments in time. Yeah. I, it's funny. I've, I've heard him on stage actually at South by Southwest, maybe two years ago. And the host asked him, what advice do you have for buddy entrepreneurs? And I think he just said, don't be one. <laughs> Right. So unless you it have an incredibly really high tolerance for pain, uh, you should really question that career path. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And, but, you know, it, it gets back to, so what you said, you know, you know, huge setbacks, the founder of PayPal having to borrow money from a friend to stay in the game, right. to stay alive. Right. But, you know, it ties back to your comment about Bezos. He got back to the mount, right? That's right. He got back to bat, right? And right. therefore, back in the game of probability, right? 
um, and uh, and found his win. Now, there's there's six main takeaways that you outlined in the book, and we touched on one being the drive for daylight. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first one you mentioned is finding the gap. So mm-hmm. I'd love to just run through these real quick with sure. you, if we can. And sure. I'm sure you've done this a hundred times, Amy. So. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for your patience. But, for, you know, as a people driven investor, this is all I focus on and, and I love this content. So I, I love it. Sure. So the first skill is called find a gap. And the idea is that you want to see what others miss, right? You want to actually spot in the marketplace um, something that others haven't capitalized on yet. And so Airbnb is an example. We already spoke about that. Spanx is a great example as a women's undergarment, right? Sarah Blakely wants that product. She's a door-to-door fax machine saleswoman for seven years before she starts this business. And she wants an undergarment in Atlanta, Georgia, where it's hot in the summer, to wear under white linen pants. And so she finds a gap in that she goes to the local mall and nothing is the right product for her. So she makes a product. Uh, <laughs> she tried to get a patent on it and there were only all male law firms and the men didn't really understand what she was talking about. So she wrote her own patent and her mother is a watercolor artist, drew the sketches and filed it in. Right. And, and she became the youngest self-made female billionaire in 2012 on solving her own problem. Mm -hmm. So this is finding a gap. She finds a gap in a marketplace. Lots of other people also need this solution. Right. And so that's, there are multiple examples there, but that's the first skill is you want to try to um, be alert. There's entrepreneurial alertness research. And this is interesting for your audience. You can catch things out of the corner of your eye. Most people dismiss them because they're in a routine. Entrepreneurs will jump on those things and ask questions. Questioning and curiosity is the greatest tool you have for finding a gap. And in the financial marketplace, you know this as arbitrage, right? The financial markets, there'll be a glitch. There'll be a financial arbitrage. If you can see that moment, you can capitalize on it, make a lot of money. There are those things happening in an entrepreneurial marketplace. And again, if you can catch a glitch in the market, if you can spot something, that a problem that needs to be solved, for example, and you can capitalize on it, you can create a very large business but you need to be able to spot those gaps. And a lot of people miss them and they miss them because they're not curious. They're in a routine. They dismiss something that they see as an anomaly. Right. You see an anomaly, you want to probe and ask a lot of questions about what's there. That's what entrepreneurial people do. Now, do you think thinking critically like that is a habit you need to practice and improve upon? I mean, it's, it doesn't come naturally to most people. We fall in line, right? We're, okay. we're herd animals by, by design. Yeah. So thinking outside the box can be a challenge. And, and I think just, I think about it holistically, like what else am I doing in my life that's hard, that's abnormal, that makes me an outlier, and that's got to complement my critical thinking ability. Do you find that to be the case? I think that's right. And so, you know, one thing that you want to do is ask yourself, you know, new and original questions every day mm. uh, and take a different approach to your work. Uh, Some of these entrepreneurs literally said, I drive a different commute to my office. This is pre-COVID, right? But I I try to have a different approach. I take a long walk. I have different people come and talk to me. Like They're trying to constantly um, have a new and different angle, right? And most people don't do that. Most people are in a routine and they like efficiency. Most businesses are taking risk out of a system. So it's a different approach. I love that. You know what the most, uh, so I, I, I attempt, I attempt this myself and, uh, you know, the most effective habit that I have in my life for this is I quit drinking alcohol five years ago. Mm-hmm. And initially it was just like a one year experiment. I was curious, like, would my life change, you know, if I removed alcohol for a year and, and it did sufficiently enough that I doubled down in a second year. And initially it was for health benefits, right? I wanted to feel better. Right. And never right. have an off day. You know, that was, I work right. in finance. There's some, some late nights. Right. And I wanted to right. get myself out of that. But what I found is that, well, first of all, drinking alcohol is the most common extracurricular activity. Like I challenge you to find a country <laughs> where it's not the go-to for right. uh, networking, for relationship building, for celebrating a win, for mm-hmm. uh, reducing stress, whatever it is, taking the edge off. And so, um, exp- emancipating yourself from that social activity uh, mm-hmm. really helped me challenge a lot of other things, I think, because sure. first of all, I had to get creative. You know, I, I have a client base. I have 
very important relationships that I used to take out for cocktails and I couldn't do that anymore. So I had to think outside the box and right. how to maintain those relationships, but also just how do I celebrate a win now? And it was almost lonely for the, for the first part of this, right? Sure. Right. Start developing new habits and all this, but. Yeah. So I'll make a comment there. As I started doing research, I started realizing that a lot of entrepreneurs, a high number, uh, are dyslexic. And uh, they weren't succeeding in a traditional education system, right? And so they had to do things differently. This is a parallel to the, what you're saying. They, they had to step outside the norm. Right. Uh, Richard Branson is one of the most outspoken uh, entrepreneurs, and he's dyslexic. Charles Schwab of, you know, the Schwab Financial. He's a that. huge center on our campus at Stanford for dyslexia. There's n numerous examples where early in life, um, these people weren't succeeding in a traditional way. They weren't succeeding in, in reading in a traditional um, school sense. And so they had to develop a set of skills that were influencing skills. Right. Instead of reading skills, maybe they're influencing people. Maybe they're organizing people. Maybe they're motivating people. Maybe they're, you know, doing things differently. And so the entrepreneurial mindset for a lot of people starts early and it starts as an outsider. It is harder, you, you know, you, and so there's something to that. Um, if you look at most four point students or, you know, straight A perfect shiny resumes, they're not entrepreneurs is the truth. And so like, as an investor, I would be asking, where have you struggled? How have you overcome that? Where have you gone outside of the norm? What did you learn? Where, you know, those are kinds of questions that will show you um, how entrepreneurial a person is. Yeah, that's very interesting. Because it is the entrepreneurial world is the business of running into brick walls for a living, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about it. And so embracing that struggle is key. And you can only right. do that if you've broken through a few walls and I guess got the scar tissue. That's right. And if you want to have a perfect record, it's not the place for you because yeah. there are no perfect ref records, right? Every single entrepreneur has come up short. Okay. I mean, it is a guarantee. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. So from, from that point, then I want to jump to what I believe is your, your fifth point, which is, sorry, your fourth point, which is failing wisely. Mm -hmm. So expand on what failing wisely means, because we always hear about fail fast, fail often, all this stuff. What is failing wisely? So I think the fail forward and fail fast is like, you know, web 2.0. That's what we used to talk about. Uh, I think that now it's about being smart. So fail wisely is about um, being smart and having incremental setbacks to avoid catastrophic mistakes. It's a mindset before you ever start in a business that says, I'm not going to have a perfect record. Uh, I don't even want that because if I have a perfect record, I'm not doing anything new. If you're creating something the world hasn't seen, there is no perfect way to do it, right? And so what you want to do is fail wisely. So the big um, idea here is set a failure ratio. So for your business, for your team, you, you sit down and you say, all right, is it one in 10 things we try won't work? 10% failure ratio. Is it one in three, 33% ratio? Is it one in five? You know, the venture industry, as, as you know, like seven out of 10 tend to not hit, right? That's a pretty high 70% failure rate. As long as you have a few that you hit way out of the park, you're fine in, in the venture industry. But in every business, what you want to do is sit down and say, okay, what's the failure ratio? And then what am I learning? So even Google uh, has got a 70-20-10 ratio. So Eric Schmidt, when he came in, he basically said, all right, our top leaders are going to spend 70% of time on core business, 20% of time on side business, 10% of time on moonshots, like crazy ideas, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be related to anything mm. that we're doing. And right there, you've got just 70% on your core business. You probably have a 30% failure ratio, you know, right? And so that's how a company continues to drive change forward. And so that's the idea of failing wisely. If, if I give you $100, you want to place 10 $10 bets, right? And if two of them don't work, fine. If three of them don't work, maybe even five of them don't work. You're mm -hmm. still okay, <clears throat> right? Cool. But you don't want to have a zero ratio. If you have a zero ratio, it means you're driving for perfection and it means that you're really not doing anything original. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I, I, I totally relate to that. And um it's mainly, you know, in the adventure, in the venture sector as an investor, it's all about that looking for those, 
right. asymmetric bets. I think Paul Tudor Jones, you know, his his rule is the five X, right? So he's he's hunting for those five X returns, knowing he's not sure. going to find them all the time, but knowing he's probably not going to be wrong five times in a row. That's right. Based on that math, he can afford to be wrong four times out of five and still break even. That's if, right. If he's successfully hunting those five X returns every now and then. That's right. And so to your point, you know, it's, it's kind of like swallowing the small loss, mm -hmm. swallowing the small loss in order to, uh, to correct course before you're too far off track. That's right. That's right. And back to Theranos, that's what they didn't do. Right. right? I mean, they didn't have incremental failures. Another takeaway point there, which I'm teaching students, um, is that you, you want to be transparent about failure. So Theranos was not. Theranos was closed. And even, you know, when I was there talking with Elizabeth, it was very controlled. You couldn't walk from building to building without an escort. Oh. You couldn't, yeah, teams didn't talk to each other across their business units, right? I mean, everything was highly controlled and no um, report of any kind of failure was really out there. Okay. One of the signs that I think you have a healthy company and a healthy founder and probably a higher probability of success is when people say to you, we tried these five things, only two of them worked. Like these three, that's a disaster. These two worked, great. Now we're on to something. Yeah. And, and that's different. I mean, Elon will tell you that the, the first Tesla to come off the roadster, it took eight years it was a total nightmare. Mm. I mean, he fired a co-founder over it. I mean, it was a total mess. Everybody knew, right? And so he's not hiding that or rockets are blowing up when he starts SpaceX. He, he, there's no way to hide that. Yeah. People know like you're failing, but then the response is every time we learn, we get more data, we get closer. Every time that we come up short, we're actually getting closer to what we're doing. That's the smart way to fail. Mm. Um, the not smart way to fail is to make the same mistake over and over and over. Yeah. You want to make different mistakes, right? And as an investor, you want to see people make different mistakes. 100%. 100%. Yeah, I think Peter Diamandis calls that the, the burning the boat strategy. And he comments on how frequently, specifically, Elon Musk will burn the boats, referring to how many rockets has he built and then shelved at this point and say, we're not using that anymore. We're moving on, right? I think two or three. Okay. Um, Amy, look, I, I told you how you wrapped up by two o'clock. I could keep picking your brain because there's much more I would love to talk to you about. Um, but I want to thank you for your time and, and coming on the show. And it's been a real pleasure. So yeah, I, likewise, likewise. Good luck. I'm, I'll be following what you're investing in. This will be fun. Great. <laughs> I love that. I love that. All right. Okay. So thanks again. And uh, I look forward to it next time, hopefully. All right. Okay. Awesome. Take care. As always, if you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe. I'd love to have you on the team. And if you want to take the next step and go a bit deeper with my content, I publish a free weekly newsletter every Friday where I debrief my portfolio. I distill the top lessons I've uncovered from the guests I've had on this show every week. And I talk about sectors and industries that I think are poised to move, areas I'm looking for opportunity and places that I'm allocating capital. I love writing it. We publish every Friday. The link is right beneath this video. Love to have you join the tribe.